This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City, here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. Two House committees have now passed a resolution to hold Hunter Biden in contempt. He made a surprise visit to Capitol Hill today, just as they started work on the resolution. This after he defied their subpoena last month. NTD's Melina Weisskopf has more from Capitol Hill. Energy was super high in that committee hearing room today where Hunter Biden showed up at the very beginning for about 15 to 20 minutes, leaving right when Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene was about to speak. And the reason why Hunter Biden showed up is that he and his lawyer are trying to paint this picture that he's trying his best to comply with Republicans' demands and is open to testifying publicly, but just opposed to doing it in a private setting, where they argue that will result in Republicans twisting his words before presenting them to the public. To give you a sense for the feel in the room, watch this clip. Why can't you show up for a, a congressional deposition? You're here for a political stunt. This is just a PR stunt to you. Mr. It, Chairman, um, if, if the, the lady if, recognized, if the general lady Please wants to hear from names. Hunter Biden, we can hear from him right now, Mr. And Chairman. Let's take a vote president. and hear from I'm Hunter speaking. Biden. So I've said repeatedly the, after the deposition, Mr. Biden can come in front of a public hearing. Mr. Chairman, I don't want to play the video, but that is not what you said on television multiple times. Uh, we have the quotes. We can put them up. You said the witness can choose. Our first five offers were ignored to selectively leak and mischaracterize what witnesses have said. Now, Republicans say that it's standard procedure for a witness, especially in a sensitive situation like this, to testify privately before giving a public testimony. Now, Republicans also argue that this is the standard that all witnesses in the January 6th Select Committee had to follow, including former President Donald Trump's children. Now, the next step for this contempt resolution is that the full House will take a vote on it, referring it to the Department of Justice. But some Republicans tell me they're concerned that it may stop there. Will Garland have two tiers of justice? Will he protect the Bidens? Will he not prosecute because of Hunter Biden's last name? Uh, in contempt of Congress, voted out by the full House, just like Bannon, just like uh, Peter Navarro. At this point, it's unclear when that full House vote will happen, but we're hearing it could happen at some time this week or later next week. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. It appears that former President Trump will not speak during the closing arguments at his civil fraud trial in New York. Judge Arthur Ngoron said Trump hasn't agreed to conditions he set for a statement. Those include not campaigning or complaining about the court or its staff. Trump could only speak about the case, alleges that he and his two sons defrauded banks and insurance companies. If Trump doesn't agree to those terms, he won't be allowed to speak tomorrow. And with this a small victory for Trump, he won't be kicked off the ballot in Nevada. A long shot candidate was trying to block him. The plaintiff cited the 14th Amendment's insurrection clause. It's the same argument that has made headlines in Colorado, Maine and Michigan. But the judge in Nevada dismissed the case for other reasons. The judge said it was because the candidate isn't sincerely trying to run for president. He was just going after Trump. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie has dropped out of the 2024 race. That's as Governor Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley facing off in a one on one debate tonight for the first time. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao has more. Good evening to you as well, Tiff. Just moments ago, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie announced that he's dropping out of the 2024 presidential race. And this comes just five days before the first caucus in the nation right here in Iowa. Meanwhile, Chris Christie, who's a vocal Trump critic, even in announcing the suspension of his campaign, promised to keep Trump out of office ever again. Meanwhile, he actually might have held boost Trump's chances just now by getting caught on hot mic, saying that Nikki Haley will get smoked. Watch. Because I want to promise you this. I am going to make sure that in no way do I enable Donald Trump to ever be president of the United States again. And she's going to get smoked. And you and I both know it. She's not up to this. She hasn't even 
Meanwhile, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley are set to face off for the first time one on one at a CNN debate here in Des Moines, Iowa. The two of them have been ramping up attacks on each other in recent days, of course, as the Iowa caucus gets closer and closer. But they have also been ramping up attacks on former President Trump, who is maintaining a wide lead in polls here in Iowa, leading them by both by about a 20 to 30 point lead. So both of them could be potentially competing for a second place to Trump. Meanwhile, Vivek Ramaswamy, who has been polling only in the single digits, was not qualified to participate at tonight's CNN debate. I asked him just moments ago here at one of his campaign events at the Iowa State Capitol here about whether he's concerned about losing traction and exposure. He told me that CNN is intentionally not considering some polls that might that could have get him qualified. He also called it a fake debate. Watch. CNN has decided they don't want the people of this country to hear what I actually have to say. So their shenanigans, their election interference, frankly, in this GOP caucus in Iowa has been transparent. It's naked. It's ugly. Meanwhile, Trump has been mocking both DeSantis and Nikki Haley for potentially competing for a second place in this race. And Trump is also actually skipping tonight's debate and instead participating at a Fox News town hall right across town here in Des Moines for counter programming. So we do expect to hear more from the former president, both on this race itself, but also on his legal challenges facing him as today he was just barred from delivering the closing arguments in the New York civil fraud trial set for this upcoming Thursday. Back to you. How much did Prince Andrew allegedly pay for sex with a minor? The latest batch of Jeffrey Epstein files reveal a claim of more than $10,000. And today's Arlene Richards has more. The newest batch of unsealed Jeffrey Epstein documents released Tuesday show the high cost allegedly paid for sex with a teenager. Virginia Jufre, an Epstein accuser, said Epstein paid her $15,000 to have sex with Britain's Prince Andrew in 2011. She says she was 17 at the time. Prince Andrew has repeatedly denied they had sex. He has also denied that he ever met her. The 1,482 pages released are the last set to be made public. They include several depositions from Ghislaine Maxwell, one from Epstein, one from Jufre, and another from Sarah Ransom, an alleged adult victim of Epstein. The records are part of a defamation lawsuit brought by Jufre against Maxwell, Epstein's longtime companion. The case settled in 2017. Included in the heavily redacted documents are allegations Jufre was directed to have sex with other high-profile men such as Glenn Dubin, a billionaire hedge fund manager, and billionaire retail magnate Les Wexner. Both men have denied Jufre's claims. Former President Trump was also identified in the depositions. Jufre said she met the former president but didn't see him doing anything improper. But Ransom claimed in 2016 emails to a New York Post columnist that Trump was involved in Epstein's sex trafficking. She later retracted the claim in a follow-up email. Trump said in a social media post that he was never on Epstein's plane or at his stupid island after images of the two made by artificial intelligence surfaced online. He said this is what Democrats do to their Republican opponent who was leading them by a lot in the polls. Maxwell was convicted by a jury in 2021 on five federal sex trafficking charges. She is currently serving a 20-year prison sentence and appealing the conviction. The five batches of Epstein court files released over the past week have contained few details that weren't previously known. Arlene Richards, NTD News. Turning to Ohio, the state house has voted again to block transgender minors from receiving cross-sex procedures and hormones. Just over 60 percent of the lawmakers voted to override Governor Mike DeWine's veto. The bill would also prevent transgender athletes from taking part in girls and women's sports. 60 percent of the Ohio Senate also has to agree in order to override the veto. Their vote is set for January 24th. Turning now to the blizzard on the west coast, an avalanche hit a California ski resort. Rescuers are digging through snow drifts for possible victims. 
This morning, California fire teams responded to reports of multiple people buried under the snow at Palisades Tahoe. So far, we don't know exactly how many skiers and snowboarders are trapped, but officials have reported one death and one injury. A witness says he saw rescuers snowmobiles towing at least one person to a medical clinic at the resort. The blizzard came as a strong storm brings layers of snow to the Lake Tahoe area. A winter storm warning is in effect as snow in the area could potentially pile up to 28 to 30 inches. Tens of millions of Americans are under the threat of menacing weather today. A powerful winter storm is looming across the East Coast after leaving in its wake power outages, grounded flights and property damage. Entity's David Zhang has more. High winds and flooding advisory were in place on Wednesday for more than 90 million people from eastern Ohio and Kentucky and up through the Mid-Atlantic and into the Northeast. New York, Philadelphia, and Boston saw flood-inducing rains taper off in the morning, but gusts of more than 40 miles per hour damaged trees and power lines. In New York, commuters had to contend with the howling winds and rainwater dripping onto the platform of a subway station last night. PowerOutage.us reported that some 500,000 homes and businesses from northern Florida to Maine were without power early on Wednesday. The storm was already responsible for at least the three deaths in Alabama, North Carolina, and Georgia, where high winds and several tornadoes ripped through parts of the south, according to authorities and local media reports. The current storm has mainly hit east of the Mississippi River and is moving toward the U.S. Northeast. A brutal freeze is expected to blanket the region starting this weekend. The storm is coming ahead of what would likely be the nation's coldest weather since December 2022. Students out and illegal immigrants in New York City has decided to turn a high school into a temporary shelter for illegal immigrants, and the decision is forcing students into remote learning. Entities Jason Perry reports from the high school. I'm here in front of James Madison High School in Brooklyn, New York. And last night on Tuesday night, almost 2,000 illegal immigrants stayed in this high school overnight. And because of that, the students who usually attend school here won't be learning anything today on Wednesday. They'll be taking their classes at home remotely. The reason these illegal immigrants stayed the night here is because New York was facing a severe weather alert of heavy rain, potential flooding, and winds around 70 miles per hour. And given that they were staying in tents, 2,000 families with children moved to the high school out of an overabundance of caution. The city had heavy rains and high winds overnight on Tuesday, but it's been clearing up on Wednesday. Local elected officials are arguing that this problem was foreseeable due to vulnerabilities during severe weather and that the location at Floyd Bennett Field was not a good place to set up an immigrant shelter. And how are the parents feeling about the move? The New York Post reported that at least one woman said to be a local parent shouted at the illegal immigrants as they arrived at this high school. Moreover, what about working parents who want their children to have adult supervision while they're at work? Many questions remain. Since mid-2022, over 160,000 illegal immigrants have entered New York City, a so-called sanctuary city, and many of them have been bused from Texas. New York City Mayor Eric Adams said the increase could destroy New York City. Jason Perry, NTD News, New York. Elsewhere, New York City is starting to evict illegal immigrants from shelters this week. This is the first wave of evictions under the city's new 60-day rule. Mayor Eric Adams announced the policy in October. It gives families with children 60 days notice to find alternative housing. Adams says there is no more room left in the city to house illegal immigrants. The city is spending billions of dollars to care for the people arriving in the Big Apple. Mayor Adams has repeatedly asked the federal government for more assistance. Welcome back. Impeaching Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, the House Homeland Security Committee is holding its first impeachment hearing. NTD's Arian Pastar has more on today's probe, where attorneys general from three states testified as witnesses. 
In the last three years of Secretary Mayorkas's reign, there, have been, there has been an orchestrated lack of enforcement of our nation's immigration laws. Since 2021, more than 8 million illegal immigrants have entered the United States, and that is more than the population of my home state of Missouri. Republicans are pushing to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas over the border crisis. At Wednesday's hearing, they said he didn't fulfill his duty as border crossings have reached record highs. On December 18th, the U.S. reportedly saw over 12,000 illegal border crossings in a single day, breaking the one-day record. At the same time, CBS reported that the month of December had more illegal border crossings than ever before, with around 300,000 people. Republicans claim Mallorcas has refused to enforce the country's immigration laws and enacted policies that make Americans less safe. Democrats, meanwhile, have blasted the move as partisan politics, calling Wednesday's hearing a waste of time. How impeaching the secretary is going to solve all these problems. How's it going to get rid of these illegal grow places in Oklahoma? How's it going to get rid of all the terrorists who are coming into Missouri? A Republican representative responded to those claims. To suggest that this hearing is tantamount to nothing more than a discussion of policy differences is to fundamentally deny the seriousness, the scope, the scale of the catastrophe at our southern border. The House might hold multiple impeachment hearings this week and next. Ariane Pastar, NTD News. Ecuador's president says the country is at war as drug gangs hold more than 130 prison staff hostage. Police have made at least dozens of arrests and confiscated weapons, Molotov cocktails and ammunition. We are practically living in a state of war against terrorism. These are not organized crime groups. They are terrorists who are financed by drug trafficking, trafficking in people, organs and arms. On Tuesday, armed gangs unleashed a wave of violence around the nation. In the worst of these incidents, gunmen with explosives stormed a TV station on air. Police arrested the men. The violence prompted President Daniel Noboa to name 22 gangs as terrorist organizations to be hunted by the military. The violence began after a major gang leader apparently escaped from prison over the weekend. Ecuador is planning new high-security prisons for gang leaders. The president plans to release two of the designs tomorrow. He also plans to begin to deport foreign prisoners to reduce prison populations. The Biden administration is monitoring the situation. They say they are willing to work with Ecuador to deal with the violence. The White House urged Americans in Ecuador to stay vigilant. The U.S. and British navies shot down 21 Houthi missiles and drones launched from Yemen yesterday. It's one of the largest Houthi attacks to take place in the Red Sea in recent months. The U.S. military called it a complex attack carried out by the Iran-backed group. It says the barrage included 18 one-way attack drones, two anti-ship cruise missiles and one anti-ship ballistic missile. They were aimed at international shipping lanes in the southern Red Sea, where dozens of merchant vessels were traveling. There were no ships damaged in the attacks and no injuries were reported. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says Israel must allow Palestinians back to their homes in Gaza as soon as conditions allow and that they must not be displaced. The comments from the top diplomat came after a day of talks with top Israeli officials in Tel Aviv. Blinken reaffirmed U.S. support for Israel and, quote, ensuring that October 7th can never happen again. He's also calling on Israel to do more to minimize civilian casualties. And he discussed efforts to release hostages still being held by Hamas. Blinken says Israel has agreed to a plan to allow a U.N. assessment mission to northern Gaza when the war shifts to a new phase. He said that will determine what needs to be done to allow those displaced to return safely to their homes. Blinken met with the Palestinian Authority president in the West Bank today. That was to discuss Gaza's future and the Palestinian Authority's possible role after the war. Blinken is currently visiting Bahrain as an unplanned addition to his Middle East trip. He is expected to return to Tel Aviv tonight. A tech company with ties to the Chinese regime is planning to build a manufacturing facility in Kansas near U.S. military sites. 
Congressman Jake LaTurner of Kansas is among those sounding the alarm. He joins us now to discuss why he's concerned about the plan. Congressman Jake LaTurner, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, you just wrote a letter to the Biden administration urging CFIUS or the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. to open an investigation into CNANO Tech. They want to open a facility in your state of Kansas. Now, what are your concerns here? My concerns are what uh, has been reported on in the public sphere, which is they have very strong connections to the CCP uh, through their 863 program. Uh, they've received uh, financing. Their CEO has spoken to the uh, Communist Congress. Um, very close connections. I've also received a classified briefing uh, about CNANO, and I had great concerns. And so I think that uh, the the starting point here is that the CFIUS or uh, and the Biden administration need to conduct an investigation uh, to safeguard uh, our state from the intrusion of the Chinese Communist Party. Where they're wanting to put this, which is in southern Johnson County in northeast Kansas, uh, is very close to Fort Leavenworth, the intellectual hub of the United States Army. It's close to Fort Riley in Kansas. It's close to Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri, not to mention a major investment uh, that's coming into Kansas uh, with a Panasonic. Um, uh, they want to be involved in the supply chain, uh, and as you know and your viewers know, um, companies like this are known for stealing uh, research, intellectual property, uh, and so a lot of concerns, despite the fact that they want to invest $100 million into Kansas and 100 new jobs. That all sounds great uh, if you're not paying attention to the details. Beyond that, I've also called on the state of Kansas, both the administration and uh, the legislature, to follow suit with other states uh, to pass laws that give Kansas the tools to deal with these problems uh, internally. And to your point, reports from the Daily Caller and also the Heritage Foundation are noting the Chinese Communist Party ties to this company, including that technology transfer is one of the company's 2023 investment plans. Now, on the point of the proximity to these military bases, what could the Chinese regime do with that kind of intel? Well, it's incredibly concerning, and you, you've seen a pattern of behavior. Uh, with China uh, setting up companies uh, buying land near our military installations. When I talk about Fort Leavenworth, for example, being the intellectual hub of the United States Army, uh, the way uh, the way we teach our officers, the um, uh, the research that goes into uh, uh, forming uh, strategy uh, is a, a a very big deal and something that we need to protect. And so I have grave concerns about this company, and we are going to stay on this until uh, something is done. We cannot allow, no matter uh, how great it sounds with the investment in the new jobs, uh, we have to stop China's infiltration of our country. Now, Congressman, Kansas Republicans have been pushing for measures to prevent foreign investment in farmland. Now, would a yeah. ban on China-backed manufacturing near military sites also be on the table? I think so. Um, you know, last year, this was a topic of conversation in the legislature. Uh, the legislature just reconvened last week. Uh, and so I'm hopeful that this session, understanding um, the dire circumstances that we find ourselves in, that they will step up to the plate uh, and make sure that we have the tools necessary at home. Because, frankly, you cannot count on the Biden administration uh, to, uh, to follow through and to do the right thing. I'm, of course, uh, hope that they will. Um, but as a safeguard, you know, we have a duty to protect Kansans uh, from foreign investment as well. And so I'm hopeful that this session, the legislature will step up to the plate and pass good quality legislation that will protect our military installations, protect our farmland uh, and protect our supply chains. On that note, there are reports that say CNANO is recruiting CCP members. Now, in your letter, you also raised the issue of Chinese Communist Party infiltration in American supply chains. Now, how is this facility an example of the threat to American national security, but also these local supply chains? Yeah, so we have a giant investment that came into our state uh, with the new Panasonic plant to, uh, uh, to manufacture batteries for EVs. And this company, uh, CNANO, uh, uh, they manufacture uh, glue that goes into batteries. And so they're wanting to be a part of the supply chain. Um, 
that frankly is uh, thousands of jobs and hundreds of millions of dollars of investment into our state, um, something that is very important to us. We need to make sure that we protect uh, the research done in our state, the intellectual property that we have, uh, and of course, as you mentioned, our, our national security. Congressman Jake LaTurner, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. As Trump's lawyers make their arguments in the federal election case, how are the judges receiving them? And what is special counsel Jack Smith's team arguing? Joining us now to dive into the arguments from both sides, we have Zach Smith. He's a former federal prosecutor and currently a legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Zach Smith, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you on the show. Of course, thank you for having me on. Now, former President Trump's lawyers presented their case in front of three judges saying that Trump has presidential immunity. What did you make of their arguments? Well, look, uh, this is kind of this is a very important issue that's undermining undergirding essentially the entire case revolving around Donald Trump. Unfortunately, I think they were facing a very hostile panel of judges. It was two Biden appointed uh, D.C. Circuit Court of Appeal judges, one judge appointed by George H.W. Bush. But certainly based on the questioning from that panel of judges, it seems like they were not very sympathetic to President Trump's arguments. And regardless, I suspect whatever decision this panel reaches, ultimately, the U.S. Supreme Court will be asked to weigh in on this issue uh, once again. To your point of the judge appointed by Bush, Judge Karen Henderson called it paradoxical, saying, quote, I think it's paradoxical to say that his constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed allows him to violate criminal law. How do you read that? Is that a fair assessment? Well, I think one of the underlying issues that was stemming throughout the argument was really is what remedies exist if a president violates his oath of office, if we assume a president has violated that oath of office. And I think the point that President Trump's lawyers were making, and he's very capably represented by John Sauer, a former Missouri Solicitor General, he's making the point that the Constitution prescribes specific procedures that have to be followed. So if someone believes that the president has violated his oath of office, then the Constitution says that president can be impeached by the House of Representatives. And if he's convicted and removed from office by the Senate, that is the appropriate remedy. And then, and only then, can a a criminal prosecution be implemented against that president. And so that proper procedure, what has to happen if a president violates his oath of office, I think that's been lost in a lot of the discussion uh, surrounding this case and surrounding the arguments at the D.C. Circuit. Hmm. And now a lawyer for special counsel Jack Smith, James Pierce, is saying, quote, I think there is a political process, which is impeachment, and we can talk about that, but there is a legal process, which is decidedly not political. Is this a legal process that is not political? Is it both? Well, that's somewhat of an absurd statement. And again, you know, there were various hypotheticals about kind of egregious acts. Could a president commit? Could he order an assassination of someone, a political rival, and be prosecuted for that? And again, I think the answer the president's lawyers gave was that, yes, he could be prosecuted, but only if he had been impeached convicted and removed from office. And so in this case, because the uh, Donald Trump, even though he was impeached, he was not convicted, certainly was not removed from office uh, by the Senate, uh, that process hadn't been uh, completed in this case. More importantly, one of the other points that Donald Trump's lawyers made throughout this argument was that if you allow prosecution of a president uh, for acts while he is in office, that will hobble the ability of that individual to faithfully fulfill his obligations. He'll always be looking over his shoulder, second-guessing his decisions, worried about future prosecutions. And that is certainly something I don't think any of us want uh, as Americans, and certainly something that the framers of our Constitution wanted to avoid. Now, you mentioned at the beginning that we're likely to see this end up in front of the Supreme Court. How will that play into this election cycle as former President Trump is seeking another term as president. Well, certainly, I think special counsel Jack Smith wants to bring this case to trial as quickly as possible. I doubt the case will be able to go to trial if it goes to trial before Super Tuesday. Uh, but I suspect Jack Smith will still be pushing to have a trial before the upcoming election in November. Uh, but even that would be a very tight timeline 
especially for a case of this magnitude with such important legal issues at stake. Zach Smith, thank you so much for your time. Of course. Thanks for having me on. The Security and Exchange Commission announced today that it's approving Bitcoin exchange-traded funds after all. This comes a day after a hack of the SEC's X account and a phony post that put Bitcoin investors on a roller coaster. NTD's Dave Martin looks at how the account was hacked and how you can protect yourself. On Tuesday, a fraudulent post appeared on the Security and Exchange Commission's official X account. It said, Today, the SEC grants approval for Bitcoin ETFs for listing on all registered national security exchanges. The post included a picture of SEC Chairman Gary Gensler smiling next to the fake quote, Today's approval enhances market transparency and provides investors with efficient access to digital asset investments within a regulated framework. The Bitcoin community celebrated Bitcoin prices shot up. Mere moments later, SEC Chairman Gensler posted, The SEC Gov Twitter account was compromised. The SEC has not approved the listing and trading of spot Bitcoin exchange traded products. The Bitcoin community stopped celebrating. Bitcoin prices went down. Account compromises like this happen multiple times on a daily basis. It's, you know, it could be, it could be in the hundreds. Brian Horning is the CEO of cybersecurity firm Exact IT Solutions. He says companies reach out to his firm about once every two weeks for help on this issue. X's corporate safety team said a hacker had gotten control of one of the account's phone numbers. Horning speculates the hacker's method may have involved the phone's subscriber identity module, more commonly known as the SIM card. Just call up your cell phone provider and have enough information to where they send you a new SIM and now you have control of that of that of that number and that and that phone number and you can receive text messages yourself which is probably the most common way we see it done with the new SIM card the hacker may be able to log in to the account x says the SEC account didn't have multi-factor authentication it recommends this for better security. To protect yourself, Horning recommends not using text messaging for multi-factor authentication because of the SIM card issue. He recommends authenticator apps such as Google Authenticator or even a hardware device built specifically for authenticating, such as a UB key. As it turns out, the SEC actually did approve several Bitcoin ETFs on Wednesday, which could provide a huge boost to an industry that has been plagued by scandals. This is Dave Martin, NTD News. California Governor Gavin Newsom unveils his plan to resolve the state's budget deficit, previously estimated at $68 billion by legislative analysts. But Newsom said in his proposal, the deficit is at $38 billion. California's governor presented the state's financial budget of $291.5 billion for 2024 to 2025. There's an estimated shortfall of $37.86 billion, which the state plans to alleviate by using reserves built over the years and other tools. We're going to pull $13.1 billion from the two uh, reserve accounts. Newsom's office said even after the withdrawals, there will be $18.4 billion in budgetary reserves, including $11.1 billion in the rainy day fund. His proposal includes a multi-year $15.3 billion plan to tackle the homeless crisis, including housing and assistance, the Home Key Initiative, and grants toward encampment cleanups, $8.7 billion to go towards mental health. Public safety remains a major concern, where $1.1 billion is allocated over four years, with several hundreds of millions into organized retail theft. The funds aim to support local police, task forces, and prosecution teams, as well as vertical prosecution grants to district attorney offices. $230 million is proposed to go into opioid and fentanyl interdiction. The vast majority, uh, it's not guys with backpacks that, you know, some folks that are preening for attention say you should shoot on sight. Um, where the fentanyl's coming in. The vast majority of the fentanyl, overwhelming majority of the fentanyl, is coming in through ports of entry coming in through land ports. 
In the education aspect, the budget talks about transforming education, increasing the funding from $18,000 to nearly $24,000 per pupil. $50 billion is going into a multi-year climate commitment as well. The governor also signed a slew of bills last year and said they would be up for re-evaluation. The bills that I signed that had new fiscal costs, I think it's in all of our interest to review them on the basis of the shortfall and make a determination together whether or not those are still the top priority of the legislature. According to the LA Times, Newsom signaled a desire to possibly delay a minimum wage increase for health care workers. Newsom also mentioned about focusing on taking down professional organized crime. The man captured in a widely circulated video assaulting a Las Vegas judge by leaping over the bench is facing an array of new charges. This time, 30-year-old Dioba Redden appeared in front of a different judge on additional charges stemming from the January 3rd courtroom attack. The updated charges include attempted murder, intimidating a public officer, battery, extortion, and disregard for a person's safety. Redden was sentenced on Monday for attacking someone with a baseball bat last year. His next court appearance is scheduled for February 14th. Welcome back. And now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, breaking news in college football today as ESPN is reporting that Alabama head coach Nick Saban is retiring. Now, was this expected or did it catch anyone as a surprise? Completely unexpected. I mean, also, I'll grant he's 72 now, but no one saw this coming. He is the best in the business, though. Seven national titles. I mean, that's more than anyone else. Six of those at Alabama, where he spent the last 17 years. Really, his whole run there has been incredible. They went like 7-6 and six his first season there, and then he was off to the races. They haven't won fewer than 10 games since then. Now, he hasn't actually won a title for three straight seasons. That is his longest title drought at Alabama, if that tells you anything. They've finished 16 straight years and ranked in the top 10. He's, uh, he's the best in, he is the best coach in college football. Well, elsewhere in football, Aaron Rodgers made plenty of headlines for his comments on Pat McAfee's show, yet McAfee announced that he'll no longer be a guest. Are you surprised at this move? I'm probably more disappointed. His appearances were usually very memorable. You know, his comments, of course, about Jimmy Kimmel and the Epstein list certainly generated a lot of noise. Uh, he did clarify he wasn't accusing Kimmel of being on the list, but maybe it's noise that ESPN or ABC didn't really want. Now, Rogers, he used to be a media darling, you know. I mean, he's won a Super Bowl, four MVP awards. I don't think it's any coincidence that ever since he refused the vaccine, he's no longer a darling, really. Now, he was already on Jimmy Kimmel's radar um, before his appearances on the Pat McAfee show. Kimmel kind of mocked him last March just for wanting to know, know the names on the Epstein list. So that feud has been ongoing, and based on Kimmel's response, I'd say it still is. In any case, I'll miss his willingness to say uh, you know, whatever he thinks without fear of being smeared. There's not very few celebrities, I would say, that are like that. Well, now, an interesting political development in California as lawmakers consider a ban on tackle football for kids under 12. Now, opponents are saying this could keep kids out of sports, some kids at least. Do you agree? Uh, no, I don't think so. You can still play flag, flag football. I mean, it's way safer, maybe not quite as fun. Now, I'll grant flag football maybe more oriented toward faster kids instead of those bigger players who might play on the offensive or defensive line. But, you know, maybe you can adjust the rules somehow or just have more leagues. I don't really think it's that difficult. But we're only talking about kids under the age of 12. That's like sixth grade. After that, they can play the tackle football. The benefit is that, of course, it reduces concussions. You know, if adults want to play tackle football and understand the seriousness of CTE, which has been a disease, a brain disease that's linked with a repeated head trauma, you know, they can make that decision. But, you know, there was a CTE study done by Boston University that showed 345 out of 376 former NFL playing, I'm sorry, former NFL players' brains. They did a study on them and 345 of them, sorry, had CTE. Then they did one five years earlier. Only one out of 64 of the general public had CTE, and that turned out that lone case was a former college football player. So I'll grant tackle football is certainly fun to play and watch, but clearly there are side effects. 
On now, shifting gears to baseball, All-Star Wander Franco may be facing less serious charges than what was originally proposed. What are these charges and how serious are they? Yeah, he now stands accused of sexual and psychological abuse, according to an associated press report. If convicted, he could face between two to five years in prison, which is much less than the sexual exploitation and money laundering charges that were previously floated. Now, these aren't formal accusations yet, so it still seems like a fluid situation. Franco has previously denied the allegations. Now, interestingly, the judge noted that the prosecutors gave the case more serious treatment because, quote, the accused is a professional MLB player, though he didn't elaborate. Now, this all stems from allegations that F Franco had a relationship with a 14-year-old girl. The judge also uh, ruled that the pay payments Franco made to the girl's mother can't be considered payment for services since the mother requested the money after finding out about their relationship, which apparently lasted about four months. Franco, though, is still on baseball's administrative list, which means he still gets paid but really isn't on anyone's team right now. When or if he comes back, though, is anyone's guess at this point. Well, Dave, as always, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tiff. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.